So we're now going to... Just, just a moment. Yes. So we're, we're now going to play the video clip of um, Dr. Francis. Uh, I introduce this with a slight sense of trepidation because the last time we played a video, the live stream was cut due to an overzealous algorithm from the providing company, uh, which kicked in because of concerns, misplaced concerns, uh, about copyright infringement. So we're going to play this video. We hope that the algorithm won't kick in again. Uh, if it does, and if the live feed goes down, then we would like to assure people that, firstly, that is the reason why it has gone down. Secondly, we will do everything we can to get it up and running as quickly as possible. And thirdly, the full presentation will be available on the inquiry's website in due course. But I hope that that preface is, is, doesn't prove necessary. Um, when we play the uh, video, it comes from a ITV television program um, from the 1990s, uh, The Cook Report, Profits Before Patients. Uh, we have obtained the footage from ITV in accordance with your statutory powers. Uh, and um, the first person speaking on the clip is Dr. William O'Connor, who was described in the documentary as an advisor to the US government on AIDS from 1986. And after he speaks, describing what uh, happened at the meeting, you then see Dr. Francis giving his description of it as well. If we could have that now, please, Schumick. And the CDC in January 83, a guy got up on the table, a man named Don Francis, and pounded on the table and said something to the effect, how many people have to die before you start testing? Give me a number so that when that number is reached, we can reconvene and get a consensus on testing. Mm -hmm. He was so firmly convinced that they could do something right then and there to stop this, um, I guess uh, you might, some people even call it murder going on, I said. Well, let's just assume that someday in the future you folks will accept it as cancers and associated AIDS. When we reach that number, what are we going to do? Um, and that didn't work. Very well. So by that time, I was slamming my fist on the desk, saying, uh, "Aren't we going to do anything? Are we just going to leave?" And apparently, we all just left. How many people would have to die? He was saying. Yes, I, I was actually saying, "How many cases do you need? How many AIDS cases do you need? If you have six you don't like, will it be 26 or 36? Knowing they were going to come, then we wouldn't have to repeat." I think my line was, "We will not have to repeat this unpleasant meeting." If we um, can turn back, then, sir, to the, the issue that you raised about surrogate testing, which was one of the matters that Dr. Francis was bringing to people's attention at that meeting. Uh, if we could have on the screen, please, Shumik, uh, CVHB 5042. Uh, this is Dr. Everts. Um, tragic history. If we could have page five, please. And if we could highlight the uh, second paragraph down on the right-hand column, beginning, meanwhile. Um, this is Dr. Everett describing what took place in the autumn of 1982. Um, he says, meanwhile, the CDC's immunological studies of AIDS patients showed an extremely high incidence of antibodies to the blood-borne virus hepatitis B in affected patients and risk groups, and a high incidence of circulating immune complexes in AIDS patients compared with controls. He refers to Table 2, which we'll look at in a second. These data suggested, in the absence of a specific screening test for blood donors, that surrogate markers might be useful in reducing the risk to blood recipients. Then, Shumik, if we could expand the table at the bottom, table two. Uh, it is entitled Frequency of Abnormal Tests by Group from Author's Personal Slide Collection, 
1982. Um, we don't know, sir, if this exact slide was shown at the January 1983 meeting. Well, the information was plainly, plainly available uh, if this was in 1982, this information. Yes, sir. The um, left-hand column shows the different population groups that were studied. And then the um, second column shows the percentage that were positive for uh, um, the antibody to hepatitis B core antigen. The right-hand column shows the percentage positive for anti-hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, the first selection of groups are AIDS cases. So these are people who have been identified as having AIDS. Um, amongst those who were identified as having AIDS and who were homosexual or bisexual, 88.2% uh, were positive for antibodies to core antigen, 81.9% to antibodies for surface uh, for hepatitis B um, surface antigen. Uh, IV drug users, the figures, the respective figures were 100% for core antigen and 61.9% for surface antigen. Haitians, 86.7% core, 66.7% surface, and others, 42.9% core, 33.3% surface. Um, the figures for the, uh, presumably for the uh, actual numbers of those groups are, are contained in brackets. Um, the next population group of um, people who are described as probable AIDS, lymphedemopathy, so people who are showing signs of, uh, that might be associated with AIDS, um, the percentage who are positive for antibodies to hepatitis B core antigen are 81.3% and surface antigen 75.4%. And then you've got risk group controls. So these are people who haven't been uh, diagnosed as having AIDS but are in the two um, control groups that are mentioned. Uh, the first is uh, homosexuals and bisexuals. And of that group, 79.2% are positive for antibodies to hepatitis B core antigen. And a similar figure, 79.5% to hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, amongst Haitians, the figures are respectively 36.2% and 39.3%. So a, a much lower correlation amongst Haitians, but a, a higher one um, for homosexuals. And then there is a group which are referred to as normal controls, and we can see that 5% of the normal control group are positive for both uh, antibodies to surface antigen and to core antigen. Well, it, uh, it provides the missing link, in, uh, with it, which uh, I, I was concerned about before lunch. Uh, the, the issue is which, if any, donations can be excluded and have a protective effect in respect of the contraction of AIDS without being able to identify the AIDS virus precisely because you can't at this stage. Answer um, is not simply to focus on normal controls, so-called, say we've got a 5% instance of uh, hepatitis B uh, and it's 90% when you get to AIDS cases generally. But if you've got the evidence that the risk groups uh, have a, a large uh, anti-HBC connection, the risk groups are overrepresented um, significantly in those cases which have contracted AIDS, and they show a very strong correlation to hepatitis B, C, uh, the core antigen, um, then uh, you've made the case. Uh, and this is, a, sub, I would have thought, a highly supportive figures to justify, potentially justify, the exclusion of those high-risk categories of, of donors or, or at least to indulge in, in surrogate testing of those who do not self-identify as being in one of the risk groups. 
th that was certainly the position of uh, Dr. Evatt. Uh, well, I, I, I follow the logic. Um, it, it might um, be helpful just to, to look at the formal uh, record of the discussion that took place. That's at JREE -E 5019, and it's page 289. And we can see here how, according to that record, uh, the CDC put its case. And if we could take it from the, the top, please, Shumik. Surrogate laboratory tests have the, advantage of, the advantages of being objective and can be done on specimens already being drawn for HBSAG, so that's hepatitis B surface antigen. They respect donor privacy and may, be the most, and may be most effective in eliminating potential transmitters of AIDS. They have the disadvantages of adding expense to the blood collection process, both through test cost, administrative overhead, and loss of blood units already collected. Further, they may stigmatize as unsatisfactory many normal donors for each potential AIDS transmitter that is rejected. For example, if the presence of hepatitis B core antibody is used as a laboratory surrogate screening test, in CDC's specimen file, 90% of known definite AIDS cases are positive for anti-hepatitis B core antigen and would be excluded as blood donors. Approximately 5% of the general population of voluntary donors, and I stress voluntary again, are, are positive for anti-hepatitis B core antigen though this figure may vary by blood centre. These results would be determined after collection, and the collected units would have to be destroyed unless they could be safely and practically processed into other blood products. The cost of the test might add to the cost of processing. The loss of each destroyed unit represents further expense, and there might be additional overhead costs. The costs of preventing an unknown number of AIDS cases and possibly non-A, non-B hepatitis cases, are unknown. But each such case is very costly in direct and indirect costs and the intangible costs of grief and suffering. Concern was expressed over availability of adequate anti-hepatitis B core tests materials. However, information suggests that some companies are already planning production of large quantities of anti-hepatitis B core and that demand would provoke an adequate supply. As the epidemiology of AIDS changes, high-risk groups may have lower rates of positivity for anti-hepatitis B core. This additional laboratory test will require new training and procedures for many laboratories. So that is the formal record of the discussion, and we've heard sir, some of the other contributions that were made and were recorded in the, the, the memoranda that were written by those present. Um, we will see in, in due course how other figures are put forward uh, in respect of correlations between hepatitis B core antigen and known risk groups. We will leave that meeting uh, there um, and move on a few days in time to the 6th of January 1983 when a meeting took place between the National Haemophilia Foundation and representatives of plasma fractionators. Uh, the NHF requested an end to plasma collection in what it termed AIDS hotspots. Alpha indicated that they had already taken such steps. And according to the Creva report, Armour, Cutter and Highland did so shortly thereafter. So that is about the geographical areas uh, of high incidence of the pharmaceutical companies showing a willingness to cease collecting plasma from those areas if they indeed collected them from there in the first place. A week later, on the 13th of January 1983, a joint statement was published by 
the major blood banking organizations, the American Red Cross, the American Association of Blood Banks, and the Council of Community Blood Centers. Now, this statement stated that in the opinion of those groups, the possibility of blood-borne transfusion of AIDS was, quote, unproven, and the evidence was, and I quote, inconclusive. Notwithstanding this, the organisations accepted that there were sufficient grounds of concern to warrant some steps being taken, uh, particularly in respect of the, uh, the long incubation period that they noted. The recommended steps included further questioning of donors to elicit relevant features of medical history, with things such as night sweats and unexpected weight loss, uh, lymphedemopathy, and Kaposi's sarcoma. So questions would be posed to see whether or not a donor had any history of those symptoms. However, the organizations considered that, and I quote, direct or indirect questions about a donor's sexual preference are inappropriate. That was the position of the blood banking industry. The statement appears to have been intended to preempt a strategy meeting that took place on the following day, the 14th of January 1983, at the behest of the NHF. Uh, the meeting involved representatives of fractionators, uh, and those included Dr. Ebel from Immuno. Uh, there were also representatives there from the voluntary and commercial blood banking industry, the CDC, including Dr. Evert, and the FDA, including Dr. Donahue. <coughs> A number of clinicians were present and, of course, members uh, of the NHF. On the morning before the meeting, so the morning of the 14th of January 1983, uh, a meeting was convened of the major industry representatives uh, from the fractionators. Uh, and that was done, and I quote from a, a record of that meeting, it was done, quote, to determine a consensus strategy to the actual NHF meeting. So this is industry figures meeting before the full meeting to see if they could determine a, a consensus strategy. And such meetings would be common uh, in this period. So before you have a full public meeting, you would have such industry meetings. Uh, those attending included uh, the representatives of all of the major fractionation firms as well as a representative of the American Blood Resources Association, uh, but not, it seems, blood bankers. This is a meeting of fractionators and plasmapheresis center representatives, not blood banks. Uh, and a record of the meeting was made by uh, Dr. Ajala of Qatar. Uh, now, Dr. Ajala said in his memorandum that the primary concern of this meeting was the possibility of a recommendation that anti-hepatitis B core antigen testing should be introduced for all plasma. Dr. Riddell of Highland is recorded as suggesting that this would exclude approximately 10% of all high titer donors uh, who were used for providing immune seroglobulin. And it's relevant to note here, sir, that the 5% the figure <laughs> quoted by the CDC was for voluntary blood donors. This group is concerned with donors who are donating to plasma phoresis centres and groups that were donating, for, uh, donating for, uh, uh, to provide uh, plasma high in hepatitis antibo uh, antibodies. Uh, the meeting agreed, and I quote from Dr. Ajala's note, we would support testing in concept, but defer until a more specific test was available. It was noted that Dr. Donahue of the FDA was said to be, quote, not particularly enthusiastic about hepatitis B testing. The meeting also agreed, and I quote again, that the CDC was getting increasingly involved in areas beyond their areas of expertise. And whenever possible, 
we would try to deflect activity to the National Institutes of Health and the FDA. The meeting then went on to discuss action that could be taken to limit the risk of AIDS. Uh, the representative from Alpha informed the meeting of its donor screening program and informed the meeting about the 308 people who had identified themselves as homosexuals as a result of that screening program in the first three, three weeks, giving notice of the success of the program to uh, their, their fellow fractionators. Highland stated that it would have its own program in place by the 1st of February, and Armour said that they were working on theirs. There was a discussion about small pool fractionations, um, but, and I quote, everyone agrees this was of questionable benefit. A hypothetical example was given where it was said, if you had a 10 donor pool and you employed some very effective manufacturing techniques, that might result in 8 to 12 vials of product. But of those 8 to 12 vials, 8 of them would be required for quality control purposes. Manufacturers would have to keep four vials for testing for potency, purity, and sterility. They would have to keep two vials for retention, uh, presumably for the purposes of, of tracing back and testing back if needed. Uh, the FDA would also require two vials for testing. So eight of those eight to 12 vials would not be marketable and that would leave, obviously, between zero and four for sale. And it was noted uh, by Dr. Ojala, quote, the economics of this procedure are relatively discouraging. That was the discussion that took place on small pool fractionation. Um, the meeting also discussed the fact that, in the view of those present, whatever requirements were placed on fractionators about the way in which they collected plasma should also be applied to blood banks because the conceptual risk was the same for both whole blood and for plasma. We will see that in the weeks and months that followed, this was a bone of contention between the, the two different groups. Uh, and some information was shared about the progress on heat treatment processes uh, at that industry meeting as well. Um, one further point to note from Dr Ojala's memorandum of the meeting. He said, and I quote, both Alpha and Highland are taking the AIDS problem very seriously. Very was underlined in the original. Dr Ojala was uh, an employee of Qatar. Turning to the full meeting, um, this is a paragraph 95 of the written presentation. Um, the meeting began with a review about the evidence of the etiology of AIDS. Uh, it included reference to an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, which had found that 40 to 60 percent of patients using factor concentrates had a reverse T-cell ratio. And as we saw earlier, that was something that was associated with groups who had developed AIDS. Uh, and that, rate, that figure of 40 to 60% uh, with a reverse T-cell ratio uh, was a higher proportion than uh, people with haemophilia using cryoprecipitate. So um, there was a, a greater prevalence of such people amongst people with haemophilia who used factor concentrates. It was noted, however, in the, the memorandum that uh, no data was conclusive. The National Haemophilia Foundation then explained its recommendations uh, about the, the way in which patients with AIDS um, should be uh, treated. And these had developed from the medicine, uh, Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, there were three parts to these recommendations. One was aimed at physicians, so giving them advice about actual treatment. One was aimed at fractionators, 
about how they should be preparing their products. And the third was aimed at regional and community blood centres about how they should be collecting blood. Uh, and if we look at the, um, the, the recommendations that were made for fractionators, if we could have on screen, please, JREE 5019. It's electronic page 293. And if we could highlight from where we can see Roman numeral 2, recommendations to factor 8 concentrate manufacturers. There we go, just under letter D. <laughs> the numbering of this document isn't particularly easy. Um, so these are the recommendations that the NHF were making to the fractionators. <coughs> A, serious efforts should be made to exclude donors that might transmit AIDS. These should include, one, identification by direct questioning individuals who belong to groups at high risk of transmitting AIDS, specifically male homosexuals, intravenous drug users, and those who have recently resided in Haiti. Two, evaluation and implementation, if verified, of surrogate laboratory tests that would identify individuals at high risk of AIDS transmission. Three, in addition, the manufacturers sh should, should cease using plasma obtained from donor centres but draw from population groups in which there is a significant AIDS incident. It is clear from the epidemiological data that the pool of individuals at risk for AIDS transmission is not uniform throughout the country and that a great deal can be achieved by excluding donors from the, quote, hotspots. B. Efforts should be continued to expedite the development of processing methods that will inactivate viruses potentially present in factor eight concentrates. If we go over the page, please. C, there should be an evaluation of a possibility that the yield of factor eight in uh, pharesis, that's plasma pharesis donors, could be increased using DDAVP or exercise to maximize yield. This would permit a reduction in size of the donor pool and would compensate for losses in plasma that might occur due to steps noted above. D, there should be an evaluation of the feasibility of fractionating and processing plasma so that lyophilized small pool products are available. While this will certainly be more costly, it may be the only way to break out of the present dilemma without going to an all-cryoprecipitate effort. E. Concentrate manufacturers should immediately cease purchase of recovered plasma for factor VIII concentrate from blood centres that do not meet the criteria listed in 2A above. These criteria should also apply to the production of cryoprecipitate. F. Manufacturers should accelerate efforts towards the production of coagulation factor concentrates, concentrates by recombinant DNA technology. The document then goes on to give recommendations for the, the blood banking industry. But um, we can take that off the screen, please, if you make. The... Um, Minutes of the meeting um, go on to explain some of the discussion. I, I won't go through it in detail. Um, but on donor screening, Alpha explained its programmes and the results of uh, its programme, which we have discussed before. In general, the fractionators express support for um, steps on donor screening and for the exclusion of geographical areas. The blood banking representatives expressed scepticism on those points. And we've seen... By, by geographical areas, uh, in effect, one's reading hotspots. Yes, one. yes. Um, 
Dr. Uh, Ajala recorded in his memorandum of, of the, the meeting, and I quote, um, it is unusual for us, that's for fractionators, to come away wearing the white hats while the volunteer sector wear the black. Um, on surrogate testing, uh, as per their, their meeting beforehand, the fractionators indicated a willingness to accept an exclusion rate of about 10% of donations and the higher costs associated with testing if, as the minutes record it, quotes, an appropriate test could be identified. Uh, and it was agreed that more work was required on that matter. Uh, on donor pool size, um, the problems with small pool production that the fra uh, fractionators had discussed in the morning were again raised in the, the meeting in the afternoon. Uh, nobody from industry who was present at the meeting foresaw an early breakthrough on recombinant products. And summing up the meeting, uh, the chair referred to, and I quote, uh, complicated issues involved, and he said that, quote, no regulations would develop from the meeting. So again, a lack of consensus uh, amongst the, the people present about what should be done. Uh, there is a reference uh, from the chair thanking the parties for entering into what he describes as an open and frank dialogue. So that meeting um, took place on the 14th of January. Uh, the day before, the New England Journal of Medicine had published an editorial written by Dr. Jane Desforge uh, that urged consideration uh, of the increased use of cryoprecipitate on clinicians. Um, I think that is a document that you looked at before, and I won't take you back to it now. Um, the argument was put forward that um, cryoprecipitate might minimise the risk of infection, uh, and that being so, the physicians um, should consider that as a, as a treatment option. Uh, it's fair to say that the editorial doesn't go on to address the logistical issues uh, concerned. Um, turning then to the screening measures that were introduced by the fractionators in January and February 1983, within this environment in which NHF are pushing for further steps to be taken. Uh, we've already heard about what Alpha had already done by that stage. Um, but on the 28th of January 1983, the American Blood Resources Association, so the, the trade group, um, put out a statement in which it said uh, that the cases of AIDS in people with haemophilia, and I quote, suggest that AIDS may be of infectious etiology. Uh, and therefore, the organization urged that steps be taken as soon as possible to screen plasma donors to minimize risk. Uh, the, group, the, the recommendations that the group made focused on education of donors and plasma center staff uh, and screening measures, including further questions on medical history and seeking confirmation from donors that they were not in high-risk groups. Now, the first of those issues uh, was one that the, the blood bankers could agree with, more questions about medical history, but the blood bankers had drawn the line at asking people about their sexuality, whereas the American Blood Resources Association uh, refer to asking questions about whether or not a donor was in a high-risk group, which would, of course, include homosexual males. Uh, on surrogate testing, the uh, association's statement recommended that no large-scale testing be implemented at that time, but noted that the issue was under study. Uh, and those recommendations, they said, uh, were intended to apply not just to plasmapheresis centres, but also to whole blood institutions as well. Now, as anticipated at earlier meetings, uh, Highlands introduced revised donor screening procedures in January 
and early February 1982. Uh, these procedures included providing an information leaflet to donors before asking of them if they were in a high-risk category and introducing examination of the lymph nodes. Um, so this is a, a slightly different approach to the one taken by Alpha. As we saw, Alpha involved a direct question from the person at the desk saying have, to a male donor, have you ever had sex with a man? Whereas Highlands produced a document, gave the document to the donor, the document identified the high-risk groups, including male homosexuals, and then they asked them, are you in a high-risk group? And if the answer was yes, then they would be excluded from making the donation. So it is an indirect uh, way of approaching that issue. There are, of course, arguments one way or another as to, to which is best. There is a suggestion, certainly in some of the literature, but somebody asking a direct question of somebody who uh, carries a, a self-imposed stigma of being gay, if you were asked that question directly, then there might be a higher possibility of you saying no rather than looking at a document and saying, yes, I am in a high-risk group without specifying what that is. But the... The psychology of that is, is, is something which um, I will make no further comment on. Um, but what is clear is that what Highland were doing went beyond what the blood donors, uh, the blood bank organisations were recommending because they considered that both direct and indirect questions about sexuality were inappropriate. Uh, Highlands, by that time, had also closed plasmapheresis centres in San Francisco, Miami, Houston, New Orleans, and New Jersey, uh, and had elected not to contract with or open centres in those locations, or in New York or Hollywood. Uh, in his draft statement from 1990, Dr. Kingdon stated that he was, and I quote, convinced by the available evidence that we were dealing with a virus that had an epidemiology similar to hepatitis and that we should take measures to reduce the risks of transmitting AIDS through blood products. So that's Highland in January and February 82. Uh, sorry, 83. Uh, Cutter introduced additional physical examination of donors and additional screening questions in February 1983. Those included questions about medical symptoms, the unexplained dramatic weight loss, night sweats, recurrent fever. Uh, there was also an examination of lymph glands and a full body examination for lesions. And for Cutter, donors were required to sign the company's AIDS information notice to state that they were not a member of any of the three high-risk groups, again, including male homosexuals. Uh, Armour introduced what it described as, and I quote, a more aggressive programme of donor screening uh, in the same month, that is February 1983. Um, the details of that are set out at paragraph 106, similar to Cutter and Highland. Um, and as with Cutter, donors were required to affirm in writing that they are not members of any of the several high-risk groups, again, including male homosexuals. Um, at that time, February 1983, um, the company had no plasmapheresis centres in areas recognised as having a high incidence of AIDS, and nor did they source plasma from such areas. And I take that from a letter that they sent to UK clinicians in May 1983. So that's what the fractionators were doing, and it stands in contrast to what the trade bodies for the blood banks were doing. But it is relevant to note that some individual blood centres were taking steps and were more receptive to change. Uh, February 1983 saw the implementation of donor screening programmes at both the Irwin Memorial Blood Bank in San Francisco and the Greater New York Blood Programme. 
the latter pioneered a process by which donors could confidentially indicate that their plasma should not be used for fractionation and transfusion, a system that became known as confidential unit exclusion. This produced a 1.4% deferral rate from donors. Perhaps relevant to that both of those centres were in areas of high incidence of AIDS, and hence there was a, a need for them to do something to try to uh, reduce the risk from their donations um, lest they cease to exist. Uh, from a British perspective, um, worth noting that in January 1983, uh, that is when you have the discussion of AIDS led by Dr. Krask at the Haemophilia Centre Directors Working Party on Hepatitis and also the meeting at Heathrow Airport we have discussed on past occasions. On the 7th and 8th of February 1983, a further meeting of the Blood uh, Policy Advisory Committee took place. Uh, this was a meeting that was held in both open and closed session. Uh, the representatives of the fractionators were there for the open session, and it appears for some of the closed sessions, but not all of them. Um, Dr Duncan Thomas of the UK National Institute for Biological Standards and Control attended both the open and the closed parts of the meeting on what was described as a consultant basis and it's uh, Council to the Inquiry's understanding that Dr Thomas may have been seconded uh, in the United States uh, in this period. Uh, the Open meeting saw a discussion of viral inactivation of hepatitis through heat treatment. Uh, this was in the context of a, the imminent licensing of the first heat treated product, which was the Highland uh, product. Um, there were also closed sessions with each of the fractionators in which each one described the work that they were undertaking on heat treatment. Uh, the focus was still on viral inactivation of hepatitis, but the meeting also saw a, a, a discussion of AIDS. Uh, in a closed session, at which the fractionators do not appear to have been present, uh, a lengthy and often sceptical discussion took, places, took place of the cases of AIDS identified by the CDC. So this was a discussion by the members of the Blood Products Advisory Committee, uh, heavily uh, populated by representatives of the blood banking industry. The CDC were not present, uh, but their work was being discussed. Uh, Dr. Donahue of the FDA was present. Uh, he reported on the National Haemophilia Foundation strategy meeting that we've just looked at, uh, and he welcomed proposals for further donor screening that had been made there. Um, he also stated that since that meeting, the fractionators had agreed that there would be no fractionation into factor eight from plasma which is collected in prisons. Now, Council of the Inquiry aren't sure, sir, uh, that that's a correct uh, assessment, um, at least in terms of Highland, and we'll see a little later why we say that. Uh, it's not clear that all fractionators had ceased to obtain plasma from prisons for fractionation at that time. Well, they, what, what you say is that they, it was recorded that they agreed there would be no fractionation. Um, to say that you're agreeing that something will happen doesn't make it happen. No. Uh, nor um, does it give any time scale within which it will. No, it doesn't. It's fair to say, I think, that there is a split between the fractionators on prison plasma. 
Alpha at Armour uh, do not appear to have used it or been interested in that way of obtaining plasma. We'll see that in some of the other documents. Cutter and Highland take a, a different approach. Um, of course, we don't know why Dr. Donoghue was saying what he was saying and how accurately he had understood what the position of the fractionators was. Um, Dr. Donoghue also stated in closed, and I quote, everyone has agreed that there is not a screening test which is appropriate to attempt to define immune deficiency as it applies to donors. There, is, there just is not one that fits. Now, who he meant by everyone there isn't clear, and I'm not sure that Dr. Evert uh, and Dr. Francis would have agreed with that assessment. There was a lengthy discussion that followed on donor screening and surrogate testing. Uh, the CDC and the American Blood Resources Association, so that's for fractionators, were both criticised for what were perceived to be their overreaction to events, including by Dr Joseph Bove, the chairman of the meeting and the director of the Yale New Haven Hospital Blood Bank. Professor Dorothea Zucker-Franklin of New York University Medical School stated that, and I quote, she did not think there is a shred of evidence that this, AIDS, is transmitted by blood as of today. So scepticism being expressed, uh, particularly by members of the blood banking industry, and some hostility towards both the CDC and indeed the fractionators for the steps that they were taking. Uh, however, there is what you may consider to be an interesting exchange that then takes place. And we can look at that from the transcript, and it's page 111 of CGRA 40347 underscore zero zero eight. And so in the midst of this often sceptical discussion, you have Dr. Bove, the chairman, saying this, and I quote, well, one of the most vigorous one of the most outspoken, one of the shoe-pounding on the table people for the blood-collecting community to do something, to be aggressive and get your heads out of the sand, is the Commissioner of Health of New York City. And I want to say he must be absolutely correct. The real problem that bothers me more than anything bothered me in my professional life is that everybody who talks about this may be correct. And in the next 12 months, there may be an amazing epidemic which will clearly implicate blood transfusion and show that the blood collecting community behaved irresponsibly. Dr. David Aronson cuts in and says, but Joe, we have that worry every day. Dr. Bove says, I haven't had it quite like this. I don't think there has been any situation that was quite this dramatic. I don't think we've ever had a situation where we are talking about an illness with anywhere from 40 to 100% mortality. Dr. Aronson cuts in again. And that could show up every day, Dr. Bove. Yes, it could. But the question is, has it? I mean, it is not whether it could or not. It is whether it has and whether we ought to be much more aggressive. One can predict that surrogate, I hate the word, surrogate testing would cost about $150 million a year. And is there any reason that we should delay instituting that? Dr. Louis Sullivan cuts in. But what percentage of possible bad units would be ruled out? Dr. Bove. Who knows? We don't have any data at all. Dr. Donoghue. That is right. Dr. Aronson. We don't know that any is caused. Dr. Bove, we don't know that there are any bad units. <laughs>
we'll leave that meeting there, sir. A couple of days later, on the 18th of February 1983, the Alpha AIDS Task Force met, and the topic was again this issue of when products should be recalled. Um, the news that was discussed at the meeting was that Alpha had received 11 plasma donations from a donor in Dallas, Texas, who possibly... Uh, had, I quote the, the note, some aid, syndrome, so, uh, some aid symptoms. So possibly some aid symptoms. The donor had not, however, been diagnosed with AIDS. The plasma, which was in four lots of concentrate, had been put on hold. And there was a discussion uh, about the patient's sin, uh, symptoms and um, the patient's physician had suggested that the donor had, and I quote, symptoms of lymphedemopathy, but little else to connect him with AIDS. The donor was being followed up. Alpha's decision was to release the concentrate, but not to use any plasma from the donor which had not yet been pooled. So that which had already been made was to be released but the plasma which they held, which had not yet gone into any processes, was not to be included in any plasma pools. It was agreed that Dr. Carr would discuss the issue with the Bureau of Biologics, uh, and the issue was posed in this way. What if we do find a donor who comes down with AIDS, and we do have plasma product in the field? I note that that meeting also uh, raised the issue of hepatitis B core testing uh, and it was noted that uh, Dr. McCauley and Dr. Carr both had objections to any project being undertaken on that. Uh, the issue of product recall would grow in importance and significance in the, the months that followed. We have reached March 1983 and as we've heard regularly during the evidence, uh, in that month, on the 23rd and 24th of March, the FDA made recommendations about how uh, donations should be collected by both blood banks and fractionators. Um, now, those recommendations grew out of the 4th of January 1983 meeting, a very contentious meeting with Don Francis pounding the table. Uh, the, the only concrete outcome of that meeting was a recommendation that the CDC, the FDA and the National Institutes of Health be asked to submit sets of recommendations which could then be considered. Uh, according to Dr. Evert, the CDC drew up a set of recommendations uh, which were to be considered by the Assistant Secretary of the Health uh, and Dr. Evert frankly admits that the CDC was overstepping the mark and trying to bypass the FDA's regulatory authority by taking that step. Uh, the CDC draft recommendations included both the exclusion of high-risk donors and surrogate testing. Uh, according to Dr. Evert, their recommendations were promptly rejected by the other agencies but the Public Health Service did put together a set of guidelines which they published on the 4th of March. Dr. Evert says that, uh, and I quote, although it was clearly short of what we, as individuals of the CDC, wanted, uh, these guidelines did, and I quote again, uh, mark the beginning of a slow change in public policy on transfusion-associated AIDS. So those guidelines went out on the 4th of March but they were subsequently uh, um, replaced with the FDA guidelines that went out in the day, name of Dr. Uh, Patriciani on the 23rd and the 24th of March, 1983. Um, we've looked at those before, so I won't bring them up. 
relevant to note that they are non-binding guidelines, um, but they were guidelines that uh, it appears the fractionators and the blood banks uh, took seriously and uh, adhered to. Um, just to summarise briefly and drawing from the, the Creva report on them, uh, plasma centres were told uh, not only to give donors information about AIDS and to question patients about symptoms of AIDS, but to examine donors physically for lymphedemopathy and weight loss. Standards imposed on plasma centres were considerably more stringent than those imposed on the voluntary sector because officials thought that voluntary donors posed less risk than paid donors. Finally, uh, manufacturers were informed that plasma collected from donors suspected of being in a high-risk group might only be used in the production of derivatives not known to transmit infectious diseases. So that's what the FDA recommendations said. Um, as we've seen, the four US fractionation companies had, by that time, already implemented their own donor screening procedures, which were broadly equivalent to those suggested by the FDA in March 1983. It was the blood banks that were proving to be more uh, resistant to change. Uh, the FDA notably did not recommend the implementation of surrogate testing and did not say anything about the recall of products. <coughs> the other point to note, um, which Mr Justice Creeper brought out there, was that the plasmapheresis centres and the fractionators had higher standards imposed on them than the blood banks, which became a, a source of tension and indeed a source of concern. Uh, as the inquiry has heard, it was shortly after the FDA recommendations were published that Dr Joseph Smith of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines wrote to Dr Keith Fowler at the DHSS proposing that there be a meeting of the subcommittee on biologicals to discuss issues relating to AIDS and blood products. And that meeting would eventually take place in July. Also in March 1983, we see the licensing of the first heat-treated product, which was Highlands Haemophil T. Uh, that was a license that was granted by the FDA in that month. We're going to come back to the, the story about heat-treated products later, so I won't say any more on that now. Uh, I'm going to turn in a second, sir, to the recall of... Uh, heat-treated products. I don't know if you would like me to do that before or after the break. Well, we, um, let, let's um, go on for a quarter of an hour, shall we? Yep. Thereabouts. Um, May 1983. So we've moved on a couple of months. Highlands uh, withdrew a, a lot of factor concentrates, a lot meaning a bit a unit rather than um, meaning many. Uh, they were a unit of factor concentrates having discovered that they had been manufactured from a donor who was later diagnosed with AIDS. Uh, and this Council to the Inquiry understand was the first such product withdrawal. Paragraph 125 of the written uh, um, presentation cites the, the references from which we draw that conclusion. Uh, if we could have on screen, please, Shumik, PRSE 304496. Just, just before we, we, we do that, same vein, um, the, the rationale for the 24th of March 1983 recommendations by the FDA it was that the product needed to be safer. Uh, that I, I, I take for granted as being the purpose of the recommendations. It will follow that a product which had not been manufactured from plasma 
collected in accordance with those regulations, or those recommendations, I should say, would be less safe. Uh, and product manufactured from it after 24 March would be safer. Might it follow from that that the logic ought to be that the less safe product ought not to be used? That is certainly a, a proposition which is supported by logic, yes. Is there any evidence that uh, anyone uh, withdrew, any of the, the companies withdrew pre-March plasma manufactured product because it would be less safe? Not what I have seen. So they went on effectively marketing product which was, in a, if the recommendations were sound on that assumption, would be less safe? Yes. Thank you. We can also put uh, some figures on that, sir, in respect of the Alpha scheme, which was introduced in December, where it saw within three weeks 308 people who were in a known high-risk group, excluding themselves from donations, and over 800 by the summer. Yes. If we then turn to PRSE 304496, this is a letter that was written to the DHSS, so the UK uh, Department of Health and Social Security, on the 9th of May 1983, and it's sent by Travenal Laboratories Limited, so the UK subsidiary of Highland Travenal. Um, and it's, uh, if we could just sort of just to find my place on it. Um, the first paragraph of the letter uh, provides some information about the steps that Highland have been taking uh, in terms of donor screening uh, and notes the, uh, the recommendations by the FDA on March 24th, 1983. And if we could act, expand out again, please, uh, Shumik, thank you. Um, and we look at and pick it up from paragraph two. Uh, it says this, in spite of these precautions, Highland Therapeutics recently became aware that one of its plasma donors, though not finally diagnosed, has been identified as a possible victim of AIDS. The donor in question is a member of the high-risk groups, although on several occasions prior to donating, he denied being a member of such group. While healthy at the time of donation, he subsequently developed some of the clinical findings associated with AIDS, included an inverted T4 stroke T8 ratio and generalized lymphadenopathy. His final diagnosis is still in question. This donor's plasma was included in pools that were fractionated into several therapeutic products for the haemophiliac, including anti-haemophiliac factor VIII, factor IX complex, and anti-inhibitor coagulation complex. No therapeutic products fractionated from plasma pools that contained this donor's plasma have been shipped to any customer in Europe. In the United States, Highland has recently recalled the only coagulation product fractionated from plasma con containing that, plasma's, that donor's plasma that have been distributed to its customers. The recall involves one lot of anti-inhibitors coagulation complex and is being taken at Highland Therapeutics Initiative and not at the request of the National Centre uh, of Drugs and Biologics. As a precaution, all lots of Factor VIII and Factor IX complex that were manufactured from this donor's plasma have been placed in quarantine pending further resolution of this donor's medical condition. None of these quarantine products have been distributed to customers in either the United States uh, or Europe. Um, the author of the letter goes on to stress the other measures that Highland were taking uh, and said that the company intended to convert both its European and American facilities to manufacture only heat-treated Factor VIII product. Uh, and they would do this, and I quote, as expeditiously as possible. Uh, for the record of the references at paragraph 128, 
a copy of the same letter was sent to Professor Bloom on the same date. In the wake of the recall of the Highland product, the National Haemophilia Foundation published a medical bulletin, and this urged its members to continue using factor concentrates. It noted that the incidence of AIDS in people with haemophilia was very low, at 12 patients in a population of 20,000. And it also stressed, and I quote, the life and health of haemophiliacs depends upon blood products. So that was what the National Haemophilia Foundation was saying in May 1983. The same month saw considerable activity within the DHSS in the UK uh, on AIDS and on blood products. A number of internal memoranda uh, Dr. Wolf had also produced an, an update on AIDS, which she was asked about when she gave her evidence. And paragraph 130 of uh, the written presentation contains reference to a number of documents that were produced at that time. I won't take you through those, sir. Uh, but during that same month, Dr. Fowler wrote to at least two US fractionators, posing questions about the precautions that they were taking over donors, about whether they have received reports of AIDS in any users of their products, and about whether they have received reports about any of their donors developing AIDS or AIDS-like symptoms. The references to those letters are at paragraph 131. The letters were sent to Miles Cutter and also sent to Armour. Um, we, as you know, sir, don't have all documents uh, and it's a reasonable inference that such letters were sent to Alpha and possibly also to Highland as well, depending on how much information the Highland had provided uh, in their own letters to the DHSS following the product recall. It's helpful perhaps to look first at the response that was sent by uh, Cutter. And this is at BAYP. 602 underscore The letter was sent by uh, Dr. J.N. Newt Ashworth, uh, who was the Division Vice President for Scientific Affairs at Qatar. It is dated the 3rd of June, and it's addressed to Dr. Fowler. Uh, if we could go to the second paragraph uh, and read through from there. Dr. Ashworth wrote this. Um, the questions, these are Dr. Fowler's questions, are expressive of the concern that exists everywhere about this enigmatic syndrome. As you know, many countries have now reported AIDS in the medical literature. One of the major difficulties in dealing with the many issues concerning AIDS is the absence of persuasive data, and this is complicated by the oft-times sensationalistic and erroneous reporting in the press. We have seen recent examples in the mail. As a result, false conclusions are arrived at, and patient treatment, as well as product supply, are endangered. The facts about AIDS are very limited. One, the syndrome is quite ill-defined, and cases may not be fully reported outside the US. The WHO, World Health Organization, has recognized it as a worldwide health problem. Two, the etiological agent is unknown. It is not known whether it is a virus. Three, hence it can only be an assumption that AIDS can be transmitted by certain blood products. This has not been shown. Four, 
Also, it is unclear whether the syndrome contracted by haemophiliacs really is the same as the AIDS syndrome contracted by other high-risk groups. As medicine and the plasma suppliers, commercial and NHS, struggle to find the correct actions to take to exclude the elusive AIDS donor, it is imperative that the supply of products, in particular factor eight, not be reduced to levels where patients cannot be treated. The statement by Professor Bloom in the attached communication from the Haemophilia, for the Haemophilia Society is particularly pertinent. I pause there, sir, to say that we don't have that attachment, but uh, we suspect that it's a reference to Dr. Bloom's or Professor Bloom's address to the Haemophilia Society on the 23rd of April 1983, uh, which is at PRSE 40411. Um, among the, the, the Haemophilia Society published his letter of the 4th of May, didn't they? Uh, I think that they did, yes. Uh, and that, that they published in one of the publications. It, it may well be. So that, that may well be what yes. uh, this is referring to. Yes, yes. Um, all participants in the procurement and supply of factor eight, either cryoprecipitate or concentrate, face the same dilemma. There is no test for AIDS. What we, and presumably other countries, including the UK, are doing is to attempt an unproven and probably inadequate screening of donors by certain gross definitions of the high-risk groups and general physical examinations. Only time will tell if these checks on donors are accurate. More specifically, addressing your questions. One, by common agreement and um, with the regulatory pressures of the US, uh, of the US DHHS, and that's the Department of Health and Human Services, all plasma donors are screened to an extent consistent with present medical scientific knowledge. He goes on to say that, that the process is cutter employer in documents which were provided to Dr. Fowler. <coughs> we have discussed those earlier. <coughs> Two, the cases of AIDS and haemophiliacs are, of course, complicated to follow up, but our investigations indicate that none received coate, which is the Carter Factor 8 product. Three, so far, we have not had to make a decision concerning disposition of a lot of, co of, a lot of coate from a donor who has become an AIDS victim. It is our plan that if this circumstance should occur, the decision concerning the lot would depend on many factors, including, most importantly, receipt of advice from government health authorities based on the latest knowledge concerning AIDS. Those were the answers that Cutter gave to Dr Fowler's questions. The third of those answers suggests that uh, the approach to product recall would be one that was taken on a case-by-case -case basis. I won't bring up the armour response, um, in part because uh, it is less definitive in that the response came from uh, W.J. Tarbit of Armour Pharmaceutical Company Limited, the UK-based uh, company. And in the, the letter, Dr. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm afraid I don't know if it's uh, the, the, the honorific for W.J. Tarbit, uh, but the, um, the letter says that on certain points, Armour in the UK would have to refer back to Armour in the United States to get definite information. Um, but what the letter does say is that um, the British company were not aware of any reports of aid, AIDS or AIDS-like illness arising from anywhere in the world from the use of factor eight specifically. Um, but it does talk about how a, a letter in the Lancet on the 28th of May 1983 uh, referred to an increased susceptibility of haemophiliac children who have received factor eight to opportunistic infection. Uh, it says as well that um, the company, the UK company, uh, had had no reports of donors subsequently developing AIDS or similar illnesses 
in any of its plasma centers, but in view of the constantly changing situation, they were going to redirect the question to the United States. Uh, the, the letter implies that further information would be forthcoming from the United States, but uh, we haven't found that document or that letter, uh, if indeed it exists. Um, on the same day that the WJ Tarbit letter was sent, which is the 8th of June, 1983, uh, the, um, I should have noted that uh, Dr. Ashworth's letter was the 6th of June, 1983. Um, so also on the 8th of June, 1983, K.W. Fitch, the chairman and managing director of Armour Pharmaceutical Company Limited, wrote to Professor Bloom uh, in response to a letter that Professor Bloom had written him, and the details are at paragraph 137, of the, uh, the, the written presentation. Um, Dr. Bloom's concern was what uh, we've seen referred to elsewhere as, as plasma dumping of pre-March plasma onto the UK. Uh, Professor Bloom used the phrase, uh, the concern about um, armour, quotes, preferentially exporting to the UK product that was produced before the FDA recommendations. Same, the same concern but expressed as preferential export rather than plasma dumping. Uh, the answer from K.W. Fitch was, um, and I quote, for your advice and assurance, you should know that we supplied plasma prior to February the 24th, which is when Armour instigates its enhanced screening procedures. Uh, we supplied plasma prior to February the 24th on a business-as-usual basis, but most of this stock was supplied to customers in the United States of America since 70% of our plasma business is in the USA. At no time have we preferentially exported plasma stocks ex the USA pre-February 24th or March the 24th. My understanding of that letter, and the quotation is at paragraph 137, is that uh, Mr. Fitch is saying that Armour haven't engaged in what others refer to as, uh, as dumping of pre-March plasma. Um, but we can also see from that letter that the approach has been a business as usual basis. Going back to your earlier questions about what happened to plasma that was obtained before the enhanced screening methods were put in place. But just picking up on my question uh, to you about the, the logic uh, of the position, this would suggest that 30% of the plasma business was outside the USA uh, and that uh, there had been supplies made uh, of pre-February 24, and for that matter pre-March um, uh, 1983, plasma made products uh, to places outside the USA, which may well have included the UK, uh, I, I suspect, given this letter, uh, and uh, that there had been no withdrawal. Yes. And we can, we'll look, um, I imagine after the break, we'll look at a document to see how much uh, armour product was being supplied to the UK. Yes. Um, I wonder if that, sir, is a, a convenient time. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we'll take a break until quarter two. Uh, quarter two. <laughs>